Hi everybody, good evening. My name is John Lingenfelder. We are going to start our meeting. But first of all, after the meeting tonight, we're going to be on the patio at Rio Bravo Mexican Restaurant. It's on Midway Road, just on the southwest corner of Midway and Beltway. Not Beltline, Beltway, which is one block south of Beltline. We want to see everybody there. We want to crowd that patio. And why? Where? We're going to spring for the nachos. So be there. Yay, nachos. Woo. And not just the beat one. We're going to do the super duper nachos, OK? Nice graphics, John. <laughs> Thank you very much. By the way, we have a monthly newsletter that's put out by Arthur. Arthur, please stand or at least wave and so everybody knows who you are. But we are looking for someone to assist Arthur. No, we're not. We're not looking for someone to assist Arthur. We're looking for somebody who would like to replace Arthur eventually. eventually. What? Let me keep aside. Put him on the curb. Yeah, let's put him on the curb. <laughs> Recycle. Okay. So if you would, if you would like to learn about publishing our monthly newsletter, it's published once a month. We don't overdo it. Please ask Arthur or myself after the meeting. We're really looking for someone who'd like to uh, do this and be a volunteer. We are going to go into our committee reports. First of all, Chris Gouldy is our conservation chair, co-chair. She is going to talk a little bit about conservation. Here is Chris. Uh, here are clipboards that I want to start sending around. You can sign up on the check your uh, put on your put your email address on it and uh, check uh, in the appropriate box if you would like to sign up for uh, either our monthly newsletter that John just mentioned or the outings newsletter these are all by email or the ad hoc liable to show up at any con time very short but uh, demanding conservation update which will say things like uh, call your city council member or uh, sign a petition um, so those those clipboards are going around on um, July 21st. We have a volunteer opportunity in Sand Branch that is in the southeastern corner of the county. Uh, and uh, we are helping people in that community clean up yards because they haven't had trash pickup for many, many years, some of them, and they are just now, that community is pulling itself together and arranging things like trash pickup, but we still have people who had, for years, didn't have anything to do with their, their trash, so their, their yards are a little like landfills. Um, the, um, we're going to be at the Community Nature Expo at the Downtown Dallas Library on July 28th. Uh, if you are there or take your kids there, uh, there'll be lots of uh, community organizations interested in nature uh, exhibiting there. And uh, so stop by and say hello to us. And that's all I have to say to them for now. Chris, thank you very much. And by the way, they've been very successful in getting volunteers to assist in the many conservation issues and events that they do. I mean, it's been, our conservation group is really very active. If you would like to get more information, please talk to Chris or Dick after the meeting to find out some more about exactly what they're doing. Next up, we're gonna have Mark Stein. He is our outings chair, and he's gonna talk about what we do outdoors. 
Well, we like to go hiking or backpacking. Uh, and we were doing a, a, two trips to the Rocky Mountains this, this summer. One of them is already full in July, so I won't tell you about that one. And when we've got uh, a trip to the Wemenuch Wilderness in southwestern Colorado uh, coming up on Labor Day weekend. Uh, we've chartered a bus. You can go out, ride out with us uh, to backpack. And we've almost sold out the bus. We've got two seats left on it. Uh, and you can read about it at DallasSierraClub.org. Just go to the outings list and you get all the details and information on how to sign up. Uh, we'll, we've got space on trip two, which is a really neat trip on the Continental Divide. You backpack for three and a half days out there. Um, it's a good time. As it cools off in the fall, uh, we will have some day trips closer to home. For right now, we're going to the mountains <coughs> to try and stay cool. Uh, we've got a couple of how to do it classes coming up in September on Saturday the 15th of September uh, We've got our backpacking 101 class, which honestly is a really good course in, in What you need to, to, to know to go backpacking and what you need to bring and what you don't need to bring uh, On the 26th and 27th. We've got a two-night class in wilderness navigation uh, that we offer two or three times a year. Uh, information on these will be online, dallasierraclub.org. Mark, thank you very much. By the way, the Backpacking 101 class, I did it, and after three tries of going backpacking, I finally did it right the last time. <laughs> so it is worth it. Trust me. I'm a slow learner, though. Anyway, uh, Ginger is she just walked out. Okay. <laughs> I, would you uh, enjoy your way on the Sierra Club picnic on the 29th of September at Churchill Park? Don't miss it. It's a great uh, picnic, by the way. The uh, I would assure, I urge you to find out more about it. Be there because we have grilled hot dogs, grilled uh, hamburgers, and also we have a lot of activities. It's a lot of fun. It is a great uh, social event to be involved with. And Dan, would you like to say anything? And we have this, it is not called a speakers bureau, is it? No. <laughs> you want to say, what is this, Dan? Well, we've decided to, <clears throat> we have a lot of expertise in this club, and we're going to have a speakers outreach program for club members who have presentations they could give to various groups, possibly even school classes. All manner of, uh, of uh, groups of people who are desperate uh, for speakers. I can tell you, any group that has a speech or that needs a program when they meet are interested in speakers. So this thing is just getting underway. I, I have a form. I don't have any of them here tonight. I'll bring some to the next meeting and you can fill it out and I'll be the contact person for this shuffling the request onto the appropriate individual who will then deal directly with the person who wants the presentation and uh, it'll cover various ecological topics environmental education outdoor adventure and so on so as I say we're just starting and uh, you'll hear more about this in the future Dan, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is going to be something if you're involved with other groups, you will want to be able to get in touch with Dan to allow the program person for your group that you're involved with to know that there is an outreach. Say it again, Dan. Outreach. An outreach speaker program. Outreach speaker program. I'll get that right. Anyway, uh, if you're belong to a group, Dan's the man to talk to about uh, getting something for a future program. And uh, we're going to hear from our political chair, David Griggs. Thanks, John. Just want to remind you all that this is a political year, in case you didn't know. Uh, we're five months away from a very important election, and we have made a lot of endorsements. And if you will uh, key that up, uh, I want you to uh, see that. 
TurnTexasGreen.org is the website where you can go and check out those endorsements and you can make a contribution there to our political action committee and you'll find out when we're having political fundraisers between now and then. Uh, you don't have the website up, this is just a slide, right? Uh, okay. The website's right there, TurnTexasGreen.org. Okay. Well, you all can pull it up on your phones and check it out, but the pictures of the folks we've endorsed uh, are there. Our, uh, our uh, person in Austin who is our communications director has done a great job. Uh, it's a really nice website now and we hope that you will utilize it. Go there to find out if your state rep is endorsed or your state <coughs> senator. We've made some statewide endorsements so far. Mark Collier for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we have uh, also endorsed uh, Roman Gallen for a Railroad Commissioner uh, and uh, uh, Kim Olson for Agriculture Commissioner. Some of you have heard these names and you know about that. Uh, we've made a number of state representative and state and state senate endorsements in, in this area. And then of course from the National Club, the big one of course is Beto O'Rourke for uh, United States Senate, uh, who was actually here on campus just last week. So uh, hopefully some of you got to come and hear him. If not, there'll be plenty of opportunities to do that later. Uh, and we need your help to help these candidates we're going to be helping them with block walking, phoning, uh, and obviously the most important thing is raising money for our PAC so that we can make contributions to them. Uh, some of you have been very big supporters of our political action committee in the past and we encourage you to, uh, uh, to do that again. This is a year when we really do think we can make a big difference. So thank you very much and you'll hear more about this as we come. Uh, I'm going to have part of the program in September, the full program in October. Uh, in September, we will be having a political action committee fundraiser with some of these candidates actually here in attendance. And so next month, we'll have that date, and we'll tell you more about it. And you'll find it by going to this website once we get it announced. So thank you. David. By the way, tonight, I'm going to have a table over here. If any of you just happen to have a credit card that you just absolutely have to pull out and make a contribution, I can take it. And we'll go to this website and I'll show you how it's done. Just a hint, right? Thank you. I'll put there. you can endorse March in. <laughs> Very subtle there. Anyway, after the meeting, before we go over to uh, Rio Bravo, we're going to take a, make a stop right here. Yes, right. And we are stop going here on the way out of the door. Exactly. On the way out of the door, you stop there, make a contribution to TurnTexasGreen.org. It is extremely important. Sierra Club has been very active through the PAC uh, politically. So anyway, uh, without much ado, let us move on. We have a guest tonight who is going to talk about something which is really neat. Peas, yes. Dr. Larry Legg is our guest speaker this evening and he is going to talk about these is that correct doctor all right okay am i on i all can right. do this without them. okay uh i have uh <coughs> control all right i thought i had it on go ahead yeah, sir it's on for the recording you need to use the mic for the pa here yeah okay there we go yeah there Okay, right. good. I, you, you can hear me, I know, right? Okay, good. All right. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, this uh, little discussion we're going to have tonight. Oh, okay. Okay, I can do that too. <laughs> okay, all right, good. Uh, well, where am I here? Am I ready? I'll, I'll be ready in a second. Okay, uh, solitary bees, native bees, uh, I had originally, these bees uh, are not like honeybees, okay? They each uh, individual uh, female uh, uh, does her own thing, okay? Uh, and there's no protecting the nest at all. So uh, originally I had uh, called this everybody's a queen. Uh, until I had a guy tell me, yeah, I went into that bar one time, and uh, once he explained that, I changed the name to uh, Native Solitary Bees, and we, we'll go from there, okay? So, uh, basically, uh, there are a lot of these guys out there, and here's one that you might uh, uh, want to consider here. Uh, just 
start your day off with a smile there. So uh, there are uh, quite a few of these around. Uh, worldwide, there's uh, about 20,000 species. 12,000 uh, of those, uh, 20,000, 1,200 of those in Texas. 1,200 different bees in Texas, okay? Uh, when you consider that, uh, who is, who's the uh, honeybee person? We have, uh, what, 22 to 30-some species of honeybees that are recognized? Is that right? Where is the, I thought we had somebody honeybee person here. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of these uh, bees around, all right? Uh, they, they have evolved along with uh, our native uh, wildflowers, that type of thing. So let's take a look at these guys. <coughs> uh, one of these you'll recognize, this is a uh, uh, bumblebee, right? Uh, it, is, it is not a solitary bee. It does have a nest and they do uh, protect their nest, all that good kind of stuff, same kind of thing as a honeybee, except they're in smaller uh, hives, okay? So you, most people, when you talk about bees, they they look at honeybees. Okay, that's what everybody knows. Uh, I would say probably half the people in here uh, really don't know native bees exist. Okay, and, and that's what I usually find with my students and so forth uh, out there. All right. So uh, let's talk about some of these folks out there. You see here that uh, uh, blueberry bee uh, will visit fifty thousand blueberry flowers in her very short lifetime. I mean, we're talking weeks. But, so they are great pollinators, all right? You see here that uh, they're all uh, bees are born equal, all right? Uh, the uh, queens go do their thing. Uh, they are all queens, again, uh, out there. Uh, they lay their eggs. <coughs> if you mess with their nest, <coughs> well, that doesn't bother them at all. Uh, they just go somewhere else and build another one. Uh, so all they're doing is collecting pollen, not necessarily nectar, like the honeybees are doing, because they don't make honey, all right? Uh, all right? So they are superb pollinators, because that's what they're after is the pollen. All right? So they're very, very uh, necessary in our agricultural crops, our native wildflowers. Uh, they evolved right along with them. Don't produce honey. There are no wax lining. Uh, there are no recorded instances of anyone ever being stung by a native bee and having an allergic reaction. Okay, let that sink in a little bit. That's pretty important to you. So they're safe to have around the house for your pets uh, and your children, that type of thing, okay? So I'll show you how to uh, track them, and get them around your house, and so they can pollinate your flowers as we go through this presentation here. Size-wise, I tried to come up with some uh, relationship size-wise. Uh, this uh, Indonesian rosin bee uh, is uh, about 40 millimeters long. The little uh, sweat bee, stingless uh, bee down here, two millimeters long. So great diversity in size, okay? Okay, first of all, let's talk about what we know about bees, right? Most hives around 12 to 15,000 uh, bees in a colony. Okay? When you exceed that, the, uh, we'll have a new queen take off and take some of the workers with her and start a new colony, right? You all, everybody knows that. Knowing that since the second or third grade back then, right? So they are social insects uh, and they do protect their hives. They have uh, bees, uh, uh, individuals in the uh, colony that their only job is to go out there and run everything off and keep it away from the hive. Okay? Uh, they, you're, you're familiar with the colony <coughs> business. Social insects, they have some of them do this, some of them do that, and so forth along that line. Well, that's not what we're talking about tonight. Okay? Bumblebees. Uh, same kind of situation, just smaller colony. Okay, uh, they uh, don't produce honey. Uh, the queen has her little uh, uh, enclave uh, here, and uh, they do protect their nest. So that's what most people are familiar with, those two groups right there. All right. 
what we're going to talk about, the native bees here, again, they're solitary individual females. Right? They go out and build their own nest. I know I'm repeating myself. Can't emphasize this. They go build their own nest. They go out and collect pollen. And it's the pollen that their larvae are going to feed on. Okay? No honey involved in this process. All right? Again, they evolved along with our state uh, diverse uh, native plants. And they do not defend their nest. They are relatively small for the most part. Uh, and most people don't even uh, know they exist out there. They, uh, you see one, uh, and most gents are going to think, well, that's a fly or something along that line. Okay? And so we don't even know uh, what they are. We'll talk about the kleptoparasites, but some of them are so small they don't even have stingers. Okay? So they aren't protecting anything. All right. The American bumblebee here. Uh, I'll bring this one in just to show you uh, how it's going to collect uh, its pollen. And it has this little scopa here. And you can see that uh, little hairs along there. And that's where it's going to uh, stuff the pollen. So that when it flies off, uh, it'll uh, have that uh, collected there. And here's an example of of one of the native bees uh, with a little pollen on it, okay? So uh, this, this has been, development of these guys went right along with the development of our wildflowers, of our native plants. So you can see that this is a long drawn out process to get this right. Some of them will carry uh, the pollen uh, on their abdomen, and you can see that there's quite a bit of pollen here with this lake, all right? So these, these guys, these gals carry a lot, a lot of pollen. They're, that's their whole, whole, their whole thing, if you would, all right, is pollen. Okay, because they're going to make pollen cakes for their larvae to feed on. Okay. All right. Estimated that we get about $3 billion uh, dollars annually out of uh, ecological services from the native bees. Now, I know you know that the honeybee uh, populations are in decline. Uh, we have a lot of different reasons. Each person pretty much has their own interpretation of why that is. Our native bees uh, are being threatened uh, somewhat also by insecticides and some of those kinds of things. But they are holding their own pretty much. Okay? They are not declining like the honeybees are. Normally, uh, a bee uh, is going to uh, pollinate one flower type only. You saw the southern uh, uh, blueberry bee. And that's all it pollinates. When it pollinates uh, those flowers and the, the blooms, uh, the blueberries no longer bloom, that's the end of it for them. Okay, they've laid their eggs, they provision uh, for their uh, eggs to uh, have something to eat when they, they turn into a larvae. And that's it. They're through. So we're talking a matter of weeks here for this whole process uh, from one generation to the next. So as you can see here, we're talking about most, almost all of our native species of plants are going to be pollinated uh, by uh, these native bees. There are a couple exceptions to that, and I'll talk about those as, we, as I go through here, okay? All right. Here shows you an example of uh, one of the ladies. Uh, she goes from plant to plant, and you can see that uh, have quite a bit of pollen she's carrying there. So as she moves from one plant to the next, uh, she, is, she is going to do quite a job of pollinating uh, one one particular species at a time. Now some of these will go from uh, one species to the next as they begin to bloom and the change in the plants, okay, as they bloom, the, the bees will change which plants they're going to. But they generally stick to one specific species at a time. 
So they're great pollinators. Honeybees don't do that. They go from plant to plant to plant. And so uh, consequently, uh, they uh, do not uh, have the same ability as these uh, native bees do because they've evolved along with them. You'd realize we did not have any honeybees here in the uh, United States, North America, until the Europeans brought them over, right? So they hadn't had time to evolve uh, like these guys uh, have here, or these ladies have, I should say, okay? So this just shows you some of the different ones here uh, as they carry their pollen uh, out there. Uh, and these, uh, you'll see here, uh, they look very much like uh, honeybees. Some of them, you, unless you know what you're doing, you won't be able to tell the difference, all right? Only some expert was going to be able to tell the difference out there. Okay, here's a mason bee here. Uh, it is going to be uh, uh, somewhere between 70 to 120 times more potent as a pollinator than a honeybee would be. Now that's pretty startling if you think about it, okay? But again, two reasons for that. They have evolved along with these plants, number one. Number two, they go from one species only at a time. Right? Now, they, like I say, they may change up later in the season and go to another species, that type of thing. But initially, uh, whatever is in bloom, that's what they uh, are going to pollinate at that particular time. Is this gal a pollinator or what? I mean, look at that. It just falling off of her, going from plant to plant and collecting uh, as much pollen as she possibly can. So she's going to take that pollen again and make it into a cake for her offspring. What they're looking for, uh, either they will create it uh, themselves or they will find a hole out there somewhere. Okay, And that hole uh, will offer them the opportunity to go in there and build little chambers. A lot of uh, times, uh, most of the time, they're going to line that with mud, as you can see here uh, in this particular instant, there. Uh, and uh, each chamber then will contain one egg. All right? That's what it looks like. Now, here's an interesting thing for you. The male bees okay, uh, are laid generally in the last two chambers so that they're going to be the first ones to evolve out of the nest. Okay? Now, how does that happen? How does the individual bee know which one of her offspring are going to be male and female. Well, they, they don't waste a lot of energy on this. They don't fertilize the male eggs. Save that energy. Why fertilize something that's going to uh, be out there and only be useful for a short period of time? Do, do you remember... <coughs> do you remember... Uh, Remember what the, all the upper class guys would wait around and see what kind of crop of freshman girls would come in? Yeah, remember that? Well, that's the way this worked. The, the males come out, they buzz around out here waiting on the females uh, to come out. They fertilize them and the males die. That's it. That's all they're good for. Okay, so why waste a lot of energy on them? So they don't, they don't get fertilized. That's why they're called uh, haploid males. They have half the amount of DNA as a female does. Pretty efficient, right? Yeah, so that's how the whole uh, process works. The males waiting on the females to birds, uh, they uh, fertilize, then the females go out and start doing what you're seeing right here. Just some other examples of how the chambers are laid down here. And you see all that yellow uh, in there, that's pollen. That's a lot of pollen for a little old bee. Okay, and that's one, each chamber is one bee. 
Well, I can't say that for certain because if they fill up one chamber, they'll go to another one, that, that type of thing. But for the most part, one chamber uh, here per female. Okay, uh, life cycle, pretty simple. You start with chicken or egg, where you want to start. We start with the adult here laying uh, an egg over here after they've collected this pollen. Uh, and you can see the uh, pollen down here, uh, called a pollen cake, and the uh, larvae then feed upon that until they uh, go into the pupa stage, okay? Uh, and then they will emerge from there as adults. All right? Again, uh, 20,000 species worldwide, okay? This is one that's native to Texas only, here. 1,200 species uh, in Texas alone out of the 4,000 that's native uh, to the uh, United States. Okay, 44, I, I think my last thing I found was 44 recognized honeybee species. Okay, as compared to uh, 20,000 species that have developed worldwide. But these, these ladies don't get any attention. Okay? Nobody knows anything about them. Okay, this is a mason bee. Uh, can, you can think what a mason bee does, right? Probably wouldn't even recognize most of these as bees. Some little bug out there. Okay? So they, they, again, they don't sting, so there's no protective gear needed and all that good kind of stuff. Uh, uh, they are quite gentle. Uh, if you squeeze one or step on it or something like that, you might get stung, but there's no reaction to that. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Now, why is my video not working? <laughs> All right, sorry, folks. Now, come back. Well, darn. Now, this worked when, when I left home today. Uh, what it shows is there's, uh, there you go, down there. There you go. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, okay. You can see that she's. Now this is the hardest part. If you remember your physics, this is the hardest part right here. So she, uh, uh, now she has a hole where this nail was, and she, you saw what she would do now is go in and line it uh, with uh, clay, uh, mud, whatever, and then uh, begin to process of uh, laying her eggs on the uh, pollen cake that she has created. So this is a pretty interesting uh, group uh, here, uh, the mason bees, uh, because they, they will uh, get into things like brick, uh, wood, all that kind of stuff. And so that's why they get, that's where they get their name. Uh, here you see a mating pair uh, here. Uh, even, the, even though they have some called long horns there, there's no uh, UT affiliation with that. Okay, so I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, here you see a, a red mason bee here with a quarter each screw to give you an approximate size here. Uh, you, uh, you probably wouldn't even notice it. And, and that one, uh, particular one, you would probably think that was a honeybee uh, because it does kind of kind of looks like a honeybee uh, there, uh, but uh, not so. The minor bees, uh, these uh, people, these people, these uh, 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 bees dig holes in the ground, okay, and uh, then they set off in different chambers here that you can see on the right over there. Uh, each little chamber is going to be where she uh, will lay an egg. 
Now, uh, 1,400 uh, uh, different species of minor bees in the United States. Uh, you've probably seen the little holes out there and p paid no attention to them. Okay? Uh, in a, a sandy area, uh, there, there'll be, you can see where the tiny little holes out there and, and you paid no attention to them at all. All right? More efficient uh, than honeybees uh, for the amount of pollination uh, which they uh, do here. Uh, oftentimes, uh, some of the, uh, these guys are, uh, are, are uh, confused with wasps. Okay? But if you'll notice here, uh, these are sort of full figure gals here. Uh, you can see that uh, when you compare that with uh, something uh, like a wasp and so forth, I'll show you in here in um, a minute, that uh, uh, they're quite, quite different. Uh, so you can see out here, uh, this is a, uh, in Colorado uh, here, uh, where they uh, had quite a few of uh, the bees there, a uh, whole uh, large colony of them there. But uh, if you look at this, uh, the, the hole that uh, she's in here, uh, it just, uh, you could, couldn't stick a uh, drinking straw down in it that's that small. Okay? So you, it, it's there, you just don't notice it. You don't know what you're looking for there. Uh, in, in this particular case here, uh, that was a little different. Now here, oh, where'd you go? All right, I'm gonna need you to back up here. I wanna get this thing rolling for me again. Come back. This is another video, please. This is uh, uh, one of the bees. There you go. Thank you, sir. This you've seen the little hairs out here on all these plants. This is a tomato plant. You see the little hairs on it. Well, this lady goes out and collects those little hairs, and she lines her nest with those rather than mud. So, pretty fancy uh, uh, birth chamber, uh, birth chamber, there. But just, just think about how many, how many little hairs out there she's had to collect to do that. And she'll line that, pack it down, line it, and uh, bring in the pollen, uh, put in a, a pollen cake, uh, lay an egg on it, and go start another one right behind it. Working pretty hard, right? But she's just about got it now where she wants it. And it's almost ready at this point to uh, bring in the pot. Pretty neat, huh? All right. You've seen the results of this one. Never did think about what it was, though, did you? Yeah, they, they sit in one place and just go around in a circle and cut out little pieces of leaves uh, uh, and show you what happens once they've done that. Uh, they, they do it on flower petals. You, you've seen this, okay? And uh, just never, never gave any thought to what's going on. Well, here you see uh, she's taking this piece of a petal uh, uh, a leaf uh, back to the hive and I'll show you what she's going to do with it when she gets it back there uh, like this, okay? And this is what she does. Is she's going to cover up the end of the, the cavity that uh, she's laid her eggs in. And that's what the leaf cutter a bee is going to line the, the nest and cover uh, the colony with. In that, uh, like that. So the next time you see those little nice cut uh, areas out there in your flowers and so forth, now you know what you have, right? Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of these ladies out there. Carbon bees. This is one that you may have heard of or seen uh, the results of out there, okay? Because uh, they're the largest ones uh, in the United States, carpenter bees are. Uh, they uh, forage about the same time in the morning as the bumblebees do, and they're often confused with bumblebees. You can see that she would look very much like a bumblebee. All right. 
Have you ever seen anything like this before? Did you know what it was? <coughs> Most people don't. Okay. Now what happened? Can you see the little nail head here and here? That just indicates to me that this house needed painting. Okay? And so consequently, uh, the paint job here uh, kind of allowed these folks to come in and uh, drill a hole in the wall and uh, go up into the attic. Now, so carpenter bees, some people know about those guys because they can cause damage to your house. All right? But if you paint your house and, uh, on a regular basis, you don't have to worry about it. But your fence posts and that type of thing out here, uh, this is uh, uh, pretty common. You see that out there? And it, to me, uh, some of these uh, uh, individuals that you see out there doing some of this work uh, come out with some very interesting patterns uh, before they've drilled into some of this wood. So these are some of the carpenter bees on top. Very different uh, looking individuals out there. This is one uh, that I had uh, for years. Uh, I, I found it, and uh, I thought it looked like a piece of art and kept it in my house uh, because I thought it looked so cool. But that's just, that's what they do. Here's one here that uh, puts this lining, and it's in the, in the ground, but it puts this lining uh, down here in the ground uh, that is an organic very much like cellophane. They're called cellophane bees or uh, polyester bees or whatever. There are several universities that have been spent years trying uh, to replicate what these bees do. I mean, you, you take a, a saran wrap that's uh, biodegradable, because this would be biodegradable since it's organic, okay? That, that would be a great product, right? They can't replicate what the bee does. They've been trying for years and uh, no luck. So what uh, she does is she puts this liner down here and we don't know really how she does that, uh, goes about doing that, how she excretes that. Uh, then she'll have the pool of liquid food down here, lay the egg and attach it to the side here so that when the larvae uh, comes out then it can uh, feed here on the uh, pollen. But this is sealed off here this seals off the chamber, which you can see there. And again, try, try, try. We have not been able to uh, replicate that. So. What is the liquid food? The liquid food is, is just uh, uh, pollen uh, and, and probably uh, some water, that type of thing. It's just same thing. It's just uh, pollen. But that's what they're after. Just another way of doing things, rather than a cake. Sweat bees. Uh, sweat bees, uh, you've encountered sweat bees and didn't realize it. Uh, they, they, guess what they like? Sweat. And, and what animal out there has more exposed skin area for sweat than any other one? That's us, right? So they buzz around you and you say, oh, dang, gnats or something, you know, bother me. Uh, they very easily could be sweat bees, okay? They're about the size of a gnat, okay? Couple of, couple of millimeters long, all right? Okay? So they come in a variety of colors. This, of course, being one of the most vibrant ones here. Here's some others that are just gorgeous colors. This is uh, uh, down in the ground. Uh, you can see that they're just laying in little chambers here. Uh, here's one that's uh, just coming, uh, uh, developing out here. Here's one that's going into the pupa stage. Now, uh, kind of hold on to your hats a little bit, okay, because I'm going to show you something here that may uh, bother you. All right. They love lacrimal fluid. Okay, tears. They love it. Now, this one over here uh, says that it, it, that's uh, too strong. This one says it's too weak. This one says anyway. Um, 
They do not act aggressively. Many of them don't even have a stinger. They're so small uh, that they've just done away with the stinger. It's just, uh, it's not that uh, functional for them. And so consequently, uh, they've eliminated. Now, you've seen them out there like this. Uh, this is where they uh, dig down in the ground and build their little uh, uh, nest down there like I showed you a while ago in the picture. And you see this, it's a bunch of ants, right? Well, ants are more territorial than this. They don't, you don't see a bunch of ants that close together. So if you see a bunch of these little hills like this, it's probably uh, sweat bees or minor bees. Okay? Again, this is how they go down, a chamber down here, uh, and they'll close this off up here. So if it rains or something, you'll see a, a stone or something there, they'll close that off with. And uh, again, there, there they are. And they're out there uh, in the sand, especially sandy areas. And here you see what it would look like with the flowers and everything out there. You see this tiny little hole here, right? That's actually the hole that the sweat bee is going to have its nest there. You wouldn't even notice that, right? You never pay any attention to it. This one, a uh, particular one here, you see that pebble there? Uh, she's taking that back over to close off the entrance to the, uh, the hive. Okay, to rain or something like that, keep other things from going down in there and bothering it. Uh, we'll talk about one type of bee that comes in and uh, uh, messes with them a little bit. So again, uh, here's the, the, the chambers and how these are laid down out there. Sweat bees uh, are dependent upon the pollination, the flowers and so forth. And sometimes, you know, we have droughts. Well, they have what uh, they call a plan B, no pun intended, okay? All right, uh, in which they will actually uh, have, they will actually have what we call a pre-pupa uh, stage, and it's between the, the larval stage and the pupa stage, and they will stay in that stage sometimes two, three years, in case there's a drought out there, something, so that when it comes out, there's a good chance that some of them are going to survive. So pretty crafty. This is uh, uh, one of our uh, master gardener, uh, uh, for the Denton Master Gardeners uh, group, uh, and she went down to Costa Rica as a graduate student and uh, found a, a native bee down there that no one else had ever identified. And uh, her major professor, I'm oh, sorry, her major professor let her name it, good grief, Larry, name it after herself. Uh, I wanted to graduate, so my little mite that lives down in with the bees are named after my major professor, so, yeah. <laughs> but this, her major professor already had several species named after him, so he was generous. Kleptoparasites. Kleptoparasites are simply bees that uh, do not make their own nest. They go in and will take over another bee's nest. Either they will kill the uh, egg, destroy the egg that's there, and lay their own egg, or they'll lay their egg right beside it, and then when the larval stage comes in, uh, it goes in and uh, kills the other larva. So, yeah, this is a... Uh, uh, rough world out there sometimes, you know? But uh, yeah, these, these uh, uh, are uh, very unusual. But the size here will give you an idea of the, uh, the size of these individuals here. Because they, they can go in there just about anybody's nest because of their small size. Again, notice that these are full figure girls, all right? As compared to uh, wasp, notice the uh, wasp here uh, and the hornet. Yellow jackets, all those guys. Uh, so that's the way you can tell the difference right there. It's just when you look at them, if, if they have a uh, little tiny waist like this, then that's not a bee. All right? Mm -hmm. 
these uh, color vision uh, goes over into uh, the ultraviolet range. So they like uh, uh, colors of flowers that are uh, purple, blue, and so forth. Uh, uh, and so you'll see them on the yellows and the, the blues in and, and that range. Okay? They, uh, they don't pollinate red flowers. Okay? That's the job of uh, hummingbirds uh, and butterflies and so forth. They just, they just don't see that. That looks green to them. All right? Kind of an unusual thing, but that's how they evolved. All kinds of uh, native bees out there. You can attract them to uh, your yard uh, uh, for, for the, your uh, vegetable plants, your fruit trees, and uh, all those kinds of things. All you got to do is to generally supply something with a hole in it. All right? And I'm not suggesting that you go crazy, okay? All right? Uh, but you can see that even though some of them are pretty elaborate, this is just a piece of a brick. It's a brick with various size holes drilled in it. Okay? Uh, and then you see a piece of uh, end of a log, uh, uh, branch, that type of thing with different, the, the different size holes are important because different size bees are going to inhabit that. All right? Uh, this one, uh, this one, I, I was I always thought, man, that's more of a work of art than you know. Uh, so you know, here uh, you just have some packing material uh, stuffed in here. Again, uh, they're looking for tiny little holes uh, to taking uh, the nest in, reeds, those kinds of things, all kinds of different ways that uh, you can do these things. This was on the side of a building out in Colorado. This one uh, is one uh, that uh, is actually sold online. But it's just a matter of uh, taking some plywood and uh, steaming it and bending it and putting a bunch of uh, different sized uh, cane, uh, uh, bamboo in there, okay? But you can buy that online if you so wish. Here's an example of one that would have worked real well. It's why it's quite pretty. Just drill a bunch of holes in it out there, and, and you got a whole bunch of bees out there. This one's not all that pretty, but it's functional. Okay? Just a stack of different kinds of things out there with a bunch of holes out there, and the bees come. And it doesn't have to be pretty. Okay? Uh, all this is is just a log out there uh, with a, something to... Uh, uh, Keep the rain out, face it south, the openings face south, okay? Very important, okay? And then the, you can see here that this has been used quite a bit. You can see the, all the uh, pollen uh, that has dried out there in, uh, over a period of time. Need to add, if you don't have any kind of uh, mud out there, just add a little uh, modeling clay or something, a little water, and they'll figure it out from there. Okay? Just, just have some way that they can line their nest uh, with, with some kind of uh, dirt, dirt, mud, whatever you want to call it. This is one of the ones that I would encourage. Uh, you could plant almost anything in this little strip here. Okay? Any kind of little flower. It doesn't matter. Uh, something that's going to bloom. Out there. Rather than having this ready looking a mess here. Uh, now, I'm not saying that you have to go overboard and do something like this, but just put a little something out there uh, for them uh, to uh, have a, a place uh, that they can uh, uh, gather pollen. And thank you, Lady Bird, along our interstate highways and so forth. Uh, if they don't mow it too soon, uh, uh, to have all the flowers, that they, it's a good flyaway for them. They can't go very far between uh, plants, okay? They can't, between flowers. They, it, it's, uh, this, they're so tiny and so forth. So it's, you know, it's, it's nice to have these different little islands out there for them to, uh, sorry, uh, to pollinate, get together pollen, okay? 
All right, I am done. Thank you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you didn't hear me. Where were you during the lecture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all these are bees, but what, what, what is the characteristic? What makes it a bee? The, that's one of the, one of the main characteristics is is after the pollen right there. Yeah, uh, the nectar for these uh, uh, they will co they will uh, collect a little nectar, but not anything like a honeybee because they're not going to make honey. Yeah. Is this a cicada killer or a wasp? Yes, it is a wasp. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, good Lord, no. Uh, we, we, we are amazing compared to other states. Uh, 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 California, uh, of course, is the closest one with, with uh, something like 400 and something species. So we, we are amazing because of the difference in the climate and all the uh, uh, prairies with all the wildflowers and that type of thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why is it that you want the openings of these holes to face south? I don't know the answer to that. I've, a, I've asked that same question, uh, but uh, all the, the experts, okay, say that that's what you should do is have, have it facing south, and I don't know why that is, okay? It could be the warmth of the sun, all that to keep it warm and all that. I don't know. But I can't give you an honest answer there, okay? I could lie to you, but I, I really, I have asked the same question, and I have not gotten a satisfactory answer. Yes, ma'am. They're pretty much specialists to what they're talking about. Yes. Uh, they're oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Do they not recognize the I, 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 I honestly believe that they will pollinate anything uh, that's out there. Okay? I have never heard anything contrary to that. Okay? Uh, uh, the native species they evolved with, okay? uh, 100,000 plus years of evolution to get there. But if it's the right color at the right time, yeah. Uh, I know that uh, some of the, uh, the fruits uh, out there that aren't native, that they, they uh, especially some of the uh, uh, melons, for instance, uh, they they will pollinate those that aren't native to uh, the area. Do they use the sun to navigate? Oh yeah, same same yeah as, as honeybees and so forth. Yeah. I'm assuming West Nile spray eliminates uh, a lot of them. I would I would think so. I don't know that for a fact, but yeah, this seems obvious, doesn't it? Well, I live on a creek, and uh, this year finally we aren't spraying for West Nile on the creek, so I finally have some butterflies. Yeah. So everywhere we hear about the decline of bees, it's not bees. No, no. It's, it's the honeybees. Yeah. So and a lot of that has to do, uh, have you seen these trucks hauling bees from one field to the other and that type of thing? Uh, <coughs> one theory out of, of, uh, out of the UT group uh, says that we, we made the bees lazy that they don't have to go out and work as hard to, uh, for pollen and, and the nectar, okay? Because we're transporting them around and we're babying them and all this good kind of stuff. Now that, I don't know. That sounds a little far-fetched to me, but that's, that's one of the theories, okay? But there are all kinds of other things like the insecticides and, and so forth along that line. I'm assuming when it comes to research, there's like 100 times that they'll know about honeybees and they Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, because I mean it's a valuable crop. Yeah, but the pollination count, if you look at 100 times the amount of pollination as a, as a honeybee does, then it becomes a pretty big factor. Okay, yes please. So you're talking about, you're talking about honeybees, so 
Right, right, right. They don't even, you're saying these are so much more efficient. Right. They don't even try that No, no, there's nothing, no one's going out there and building nests next to their fields and that type of thing. That's why I'm encouraging people to do that around their home. Okay? Question over here. All right. I'm assuming too, uh, like I know with butterflies, certain specific species are adapted to a certain plant, and the plant puts it in the right position so the pollen gets there. I'm assuming it's the same way with the later bees, whereas the honeybees can probably pollinate more different species. Uh, there, uh, the evolution of these bees uh, has occurred with the native species, and they will stick with those if, if given a chance. Like uh, uh, the example I used with the southern uh, blueberry bee, okay? Uh, that's the only thing it'll pollinate, okay? And there are some of those out there that do that. But others in that group uh, will pollinate anything. Uh, they, but they go from a, one species at a time, okay? So during this season, or their lifespan, they may pollinate four or five different uh, uh, plants, different species of plant, but generally only one at a time. The thing that people call hover bees or those bees, uh, there's a, something we've always called hover bees, or these little things that look like bees that hover a lot. But I'm not, not sure that they're really bees. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know that term. Yes, please. How does a, a bee like the southeastern bumblebee, a uh, southeastern blueberry bee, survive if the only it doesn't if it only pollinates it doesn't plant. so it dies off uh -huh. and then but it's laid it's laid its eggs and that type of thing and and those uh, will hatch uh, ready to go for the next spring yeah That's, and again some of them will actually uh, uh, go. Uh, a season or two seasons uh, in the process and, and come out two or three seasons later. So not all of them come out at the same time, yeah, or same <coughs> same year cycle. Yes, please. So do the um, honeybees compete with the native bees anyway? Well, uh, well uh, compete, that's a hard term. Uh, the to no, 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 no. What, what's going to happen here is that uh, your bees are, uh, are going to go out there and they're going to be hunting pollen. And you're not going to have a native bee pushing a honeybee out of the way or the other, other way around. Yeah. They, they're just after the same thing. Okay. If you built one of these um, homes at your uh -huh. house, uh, do they use the holes over and over again? Or yeah, you, you can. Uh, what, what you do is uh, at the end of the season or every couple of two or three years, uh, just go in and, and clean the hole out and and uh, start it again. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, those materials have to be natural. I'm thinking a good way to recycle plastic drinking straws. Drinking I mean, straws. That, that works. They'll go for yeah, the they'll go. They'll go for the drinking straws. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they will. Yes, sir. I noticed in your picture it showed a little line when they gave one, two, three, four, five. Yes, sir. I'm assuming. When they hatch them, they stay in those little things for a certain amount of time before you come out. Yes, sir. And so one has to come out before the next one. Right. Out. Yeah. Uh, and and it's kind of like time release. Yeah. That's the way it works. Um, so the native bees, who's tracking or are they tracking the population? Like, like, there's, a group, there's a group out of uh, University of Texas in San Antonio that uh, is, is probably your best source of information. Uh, uh, from them, uh, I had his name up there one time, uh, but he, they're the uh, probably the leading expert on uh, native bees. Could it be that they're just not exposed to the as honeybees are in our industrial agriculture setting? That's true. The honeybees, you got honey, okay? You get, get something out of it, but you don't think about all the pollination that goes on out there from these guys, okay? Uh, so much more pollination than uh, you would from uh, uh, honeybees. But everybody wants the honey. Yeah. Yes, please. What would happen to the, what does happen to the bees if they get into genetically modified plants? I don't, I have not seen anything, uh, any data on that. So I don't know. Yeah. All right. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you. Thank you.
very much. That was very interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, we are going to be going someplace right after this, over to that table to see David <laughs> and discuss with him about Turn Texas Green, right? Everybody's going to be in a big line there, and then following that, we're going to go over to Rio Bravo. And I'm sure if you have any questions for Dr. Lay, you'll be here for a few moments at least. Is that correct, Doctor? Yes, sir. Very good. Well, if there is anything that anybody would like to say, please speak now. Forever hold your peace. That concludes our meeting tonight. And next month, we are going to be not meeting in this room. We're going to be in the next door. This is our animal creature night. We're going to have animals. <laughs> The great grandkids, all right. I will do that. I mean, no, I'll bring the grandkids. So, anyway, we're looking forward to it. Thank you very much for coming. And Rio Bravo, we'll see you all over there in just a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you.